thank you for joining our meeting. And um, it's hard to believe that our last meeting was March 10th, right before all of this happened, our last um, in-person meeting. It seems like forever ago. But here we are. So I'd like to call to order the um, May 12th Sherburn School Committee meeting. It's at 5.02 and we're gonna get started. Um, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take any public comments. So before we get started, I'm gonna kind of lay out the groundwork in case people haven't joined on the call before. Um, the way this runs is since um, we're under an order from the governor about COVID-19, we're allowed to conduct our uh, meetings via Zoom and it satisfies our open meeting law. We still do have a public comment section that being said, um, if you have a comment to make, there won't be a dialogue back and forth. It will simply be a comment. And um, after that point, those will you will be muted so that we can continue on with our meeting. And Sherburn School Committee, we're gonna run this the same way we did on the joint. When you have, um, when we have a vote, we'll just take everybody off mute. Otherwise, if you'll raise your hand or somehow indicate to me, um, either on the side or something that you wish to be recognized, and then I will call on that person. Um, so with that being said, let's get started with comment and anyone who has a public comment um, and Don, if you'll help me um, and also remember in your vote you have to state your name so that the person who is um, transcribing the minutes will have an easier time to write them down so does anyone have any public comment before we um, go ahead you see any Don? hands raised okay all right all right the, so then we're going to move on we have our CSA co-presidents. I see Hannah on there. So Hannah, if you want to unmute and give us an update about Pine Hill, because we haven't had one for a while. We were in school up until a point. And, and so maybe you can just give us an update about CSA, which the kids really miss the Friday meetings and the things that you all contribute to that. Yeah. Um, Hannah Ireland, CSA co-president. Um, Molly and I met last week to sort of try to wrap up the year. Um, and we met with our treasurer, Heather, and it looks like we're going to be either a little bit above or just even with our budget. Um, we didn't get to do our spring fundraiser or um, the luau and all that, but with the success of our other events and um, some leftover money from the auction, we're, we're about even and maybe we'll be like a little bit over. So that's good. Um, we are busy trying to fill next year's positions. Um, we have a couple open, um, some big ones. Um, Tara Horahan and Royal Abrams are gonna be taking over as co-presidents. Um, so that's exciting. We've been doing a lot of talking and explaining how we're gonna figure this out next year. Um, we'll probably, Molly and I will probably help out quite a bit at the beginning of the year just to sort of transition and, you know, make it smooth. Um, we've also been, um, brainstorming some creative ideas for fundraising for both you know monster mash and stuff like that and also for the auction um, just because we don't know what it's going to be like and um, we want to be able to be sensitive to people's finances and um, but also be able to provide fun stuff for our kids so um, we're working on that um, and what else Oh, we have our CSA scholarship for seniors. Um, we have a couple of entries. It's an essay contest. And um, we're gonna be voting on that um, at the end of this week. And then we give, we give the, the prize in June. So I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions for Hannah? Or, so if not, I'd like to say Hannah that I did that. I, did, I was a co-president um, for a term and it's a lot of work, but I have to say the reward is great because you can see right when your kid gets home when they had a program and you know that you, your money helped go to that. So I want to thank you all for all the hard work because you have sure. been very, very inventive on everything that you did for fundraising and you made it fun for the kids and you raised money. So all the way around, it was just a great result. And um, I know we're missing all these programs here at the end because what you do is very enriching and without the CSA support, um, Pine Hill couldn't have as many enriching activities for our children. So thank you. And thank You're you to welcome. Molly too. Sure. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Okay. So now we'll move straight into the reports. Dr. Brown, I'm going to have you go first for the principal's report. 
excellent. I just unmuted myself. Um, I uh, recognize as parents and school committee members, you've received lots and lots of information uh, as our teachers have, re have moved from phase one to phase two to now phase three in the remote learning plan. Um, but I did want to publicly um, uh, recognize that the Pine Hill educators and support staff have risen to new professional heights uh, since school closing on March 13th. Um, uh, before the state and our school system officiated a plan for remote learning and the, our teachers were already out of the gate uh, forging ways to connect with students through through Zoom or, or Google Meet uh, for class meetings, et cetera, the, the social and emotional, the attention for social and emotional learning and, and uh, care has, has been very impressive. Um, our educators and support staff have been committed to learning a host of new resources and technology applications, and I, um, uh, you know, I keep thinking of little opportunities for silver linings and uh, our, um, the tools that teachers use for, for focused uh, and engaged learning will be stronger in the long run. Uh, I wanted to also give a shout out to uh, Ms. Ryan, our librarian, and Ms. Hodge, our music teacher. Um, through them, uh, our community connections have been um, uh, as strong as possible in this remote learning time through the all school meeting and um, the um, the opportunity for social connection and, and a little bit of frolic, um, not lost on the Pine Hill community um, as we give virtual hugs and see one another's pets and um, connect uh, levels. Um, behind the scenes, in addition to uh, supporting teachers and their collaboration so that they can learn from one another. Uh, we've been busy, our administrative team has been busy recruiting and getting ready to hire. Uh, uh, as you are probably aware, we've, we have some retirements and some staff changes. So uh, we're currently posting and recruiting uh, for kindergarten, first grade, physical education, and um, one of our admin assistants in the front office is retiring. I am assuming our superintendent a little later on will speak about Mr. Carnes's news. Okay, so I will, mum's the word. Uh, I also wanted uh, to just let you know, um, our teachers and, and many parents who've reached out to me for, for formal or informal reasons, uh, I, I'm hearing a lot of, of uh, people putting their heads together to come up with ideas for how we can continue the Pine Hill way of celebrating our students. So we're really looking behind the scenes, uh, ways that we can recognize our fifth graders as they matriculate uh, to middle school, uh, welcome new kindergarten or orient new kindergartners who will be meeting probably virtually um, initially and, and uh, heaven willing um, in person a little bit, a little bit later on. Uh, but lots of uh, lots of things going behind the scenes as we're organizing for placement and building next year schedule and and uh, obviously none of those things have stopped and uh, we're trying to, to to learn from everything that's currently going on and and to um, I, I think our key word next year we're gonna have to get the word flexibility in our in our Pine Hill promise somehow uh, because we've all we've all needed to to uh, to be extra flexible, but uh, I just wanted to assure you that all of all of those structures behind the scenes are are in place. Uh, Jim Carnes and I meet with every grade level team every week. Um, specialists, uh, the special ed department meets weekly, so there's a lot of collaboration. Uh, it just it just looks like this. <laughs> so, any any questions about remote learning? I'm happy to. Um, speak to to where we're at and what our charge is. I just didn't want to duplicate information that I know you've you've received from our superintendent's office. Anybody on school committee with a question for Dr. Brown? Go ahead, Amanda. I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you and everyone so much because what you all have been doing is extraordinary, and I know that your teachers are doing it 
while they're trying to teach their own kids at home and juggling all kinds of things and working before the kids get up and working after the kids go to bed. And it's just all been extraordinary. Like there's so much richness coming at us every day um, that I feel bad that we just can't do it all, <laughs> but it's all so great. Um, so thank you so much. And please share our thanks with, with everyone on your team. I will happily do that. Thank you. As you know, every family's sweet spot is very, very different depending on their circumstances. So too much, too little, too hard, too easy, just, you know, um, uh, but the, the parent feedback uh, solicited and, and uh, just through good old fashioned reaching out through our community connections uh, has been very valuable to uh, myself and, and of course our educators. So thank you for your support. Nancy. Yes, um, I had a couple of parents call and ask about some of the policies regarding teacher management. Kids, parents of kids in different grade levels seek an engagement for teachers, and even parents with twins who are in the same grade. Just engage a lot together. So I didn't know what Nancy, there's yeah. Nancy, there's something I think wrong with your audio. Yeah, it's oh. kind of, it's, it it sounds like you're in a cartoon. Oh, can you turn me up? Oh, it's bubbly. Um Angie? I, yeah. I'm getting, I'm getting um, a Wi-Fi extender coming next week from Amazon because we're having Wi-Fi issues. Um I do okay. I do think that um if I heard the first part of your question, Nancy. Yep. That I'm actually going to talk to some of the remote learning questions that people might have, and so is Beth with me in the superintendent update, and then Barb can chime in too, if okay. that's helpful. Yep. Okay. And then maybe th maybe that audio thing will work out. I could. I just started to hear you, and then it broke up. Okay. So we'll try that, and if it's not addressed, then we'll circle back around um, before we go on to the ever exciting warrant reports. So again, <laughs> um, and I know Amanda, you were speaking from experience because you're a teacher and a parent, so you're trying to teach not only your kids, but you're teaching the seniors where you teach. So, um, it, and it, it's different, but I do have to say that um, my son's class, it's been great. I sent Dr. Brown an email just wanting, and I have to say the extras, I've really enjoyed. I've done drawing with Mr. Barry online because I'm not an artist and I really did enjoy that. So I think all the extras too that Pine Hills put out there has been um, a lot of fun. So let's move on then to the superintendent update. Um, and the assistant super, superintendent update. And uh, Dr. Keo, I'll let you uh, shift over to Beth because you all probably be complimenting each other. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you, Hannah, for um, coming to the meeting tonight and for everything that you guys do uh, with the CSA and Barb for your um, update as well. I agree with Amanda that our teachers have really um, done an amazing job under very trying circumstances. Uh, I think you captured it well, Amanda, as you know, and Beth knows, and if there are any other teachers who have young children on uh, tonight know, it's really, really hard to, to teach and um, co-teach your children. So it's been a big ask of our teachers, and I think that they've, um, I think they've really stepped up. And I don't think any of us in the school department would say, we've got it down. I don't think we're sitting back and now patting ourselves on the back and saying, yep, we're all set now. Uh, it's been a real, real challenge. The pandemic is a dilemma. And by that, I mean, there aren't any really easy answers. And um, to that end, we had, um, we had some great parent Zoom meetings last week. We actually had four of them. Uh, I did those with Beth. And we did our best to answer questions for parents. Because this is an evolving situation, there really aren't easy answers. And I had a great conversation with a, a colleague of mine who's retired, and he's just amazed at what's going on in education because this has never, ever come up. Nothing even close to this. I tried to run some, some possible close kind of challenges, and he's like, no, nah, not even close. And I agree with him. Um, it's just a big part of the challenge is that you feel like you're working twice as hard, but uh, accomplishing half of what you'd like to. And that goes for pretty much anyone involved in the schools and probably school committee too. So it, it's, been, it's been a challenge, and, um, but I, I thank uh, you, Barb, and your staff for 
um, their hard work and of course all of our teachers across the district because we know how much time and energy you guys are putting into it. Um, along those lines, we will have a parent Zoom meeting next week as well. So we're gonna try and do these uh, more frequently just because I think parents benefit from hearing about what's going on kind of from the, from the top. And, um, and so we're gonna provide these opportunities. Uh, it will be next week on Wednesday from three to four. And um, you know, all are welcome. Uh, we want to probably maintain the same format where people can um, enter their questions during the chat, but we're also gonna ask parents to write down what they're thinking in advance, kind of like they do for challenge success events. And that way we have an idea of what's on people's minds in advance. So I'll be sending something out probably Thursday about that meeting that will take place next Wednesday. Um, the, uh, one of the things that Barb alluded to that uh, I realized since we haven't had a school committee meeting, I'm not sure every school committee member knows this, uh, but I hope so. Uh, we have actually asked Jim if he'd be willing to step up for the interim assistant principal job at Chickering School over in Dover next year, because he uh, has been, been doing such a fine job this year at Pine Hill, he seemed like the most logical person to reach out to. Uh, and the reason there's a vacancy there is because Deb Reinemann, who's the current assistant principal at Chickering, is stepping into the principal's role. So these are tough decisions that we've made about interims. Uh, but again, this is, this is a, due to this really evolving and uncertain situation. If you think for a minute, if you wanted to conduct a principal search in the middle of this, would your pool be the same pool you would have if you did not um, have a pandemic going on? In other words, would people potentially pull back and say, I'm not applying for another job during these uncertain times, the economic uh, uncertainty makes me nervous. I have a family. I need a secure position. Does that result in a, a possibly a changed pool? And I've concluded that it has, and that's why we've gone to some interim positions for this coming year, uh, FY21. And um, we're very, very fortunate that we have people in house who can step up for these roles. So Jim. I want to. I know he's not here this evening. He's not feeling well. He would typically be here, uh, and uh, I just want to extend my appreciation to him for what he's done during this uh, past six to seven weeks, and um, and for what he will do as we transition back to Allison uh, in roughly a week, uh, and then beyond next year. So. Um, but that's a one-year appointment and uh, you know we'll see how it goes from there. Um, I wanted to let the school committee know that um, um, we are thinking uh, a lot about next year and uh, again the big challenge is that we frequently don't know what the guidance will be from the governor or the commissioner, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way because I actually am really truly grateful to the hard work that they and their folks have done. But the fact of the matter is, there are so many factors to consider that we often, they can't always give us guidance a month before something's changing. So for example, on May 18th, we're supposed to hear about more significant changes in the state in terms of reopening the state. But we haven't really yet, and it's the 12th, so that's six days away. So how do you plan for something if you don't know what they're going to allow or not allow? And that is our big challenge, right? As we start thinking about next year, how do we know how many students they will allow in a classroom? How, many, how do we know how many students will be allowed to ride on a bus? Will buses be allowed? Will ath athletic activities be allowed? Will recess be allowed? Will people be required to wear face coverings in schools? Will they be able to serve food? All sorts of really, will remote learning count again? Because this was a special circumstance that they actually counted remote learning. In the past, it would not have counted as instructional time. So unless you had special you know, dispensation. So 
we have um, a lot to work on. And to that end, we are developing a task force. So like the Start Times Task Force, um, it will have subcommittees that will focus on specific areas that are of importance to us. For example, as I mentioned, the transportation question. Um, and these, by the way, dovetail, right? So transportation dovetails with our scheduling, for example. We would have a committee that would look at our scheduling because we have to decide what our schedules will look like based on the feedback and guidance we get from the state. The state says you can only have 10 kids in a classroom and we don't have enough classrooms to accommodate all of our students. We may in fact have to come up with another model, whether it's a half day in, half day out, or one day in, one day out, or one, one schedule for the secondary level and another schedule for the primary elementary level. All of those things have to be worked out. And like the Start Times Task Force, if each subcommittee has a purpose, and we haven't nailed down specifically what those subcommittees are, we're actually gonna be talking about that tomorrow with the full leadership team for the district. But like the Start Times Task Force Committee, there'll be a point person who's responsible for reporting back to this task force about the progress they're making as they look into these, um, these potential issues, for example. Um, there should be, I would argue, some kind of committee that looks at the health regulations, whether they're from DPH or from the Board of Health. Are we going to take the temperature of every student as they enter the school? Are we going to use thermal thermometers? Um, I've heard there are thermal cameras out there that uh, can tell whether or not somebody has a fever. Um, what would we do if somebody was um, was to come down with some kind of symptom, symptoms that fit with uh, COVID-19 during the school day? This health committee would then look at all of those possible scenarios, see what's out there, see what's being done, and then make recommendations to, the, to me, the administration, ultimately the superintendent, and thus the school committee or eventually the school committee as to what we would recommend our reopening look like. We're starting to get some really cool guidance in this regard. For example, um, this morning I was on a, a, a um, conference call with four administrators from Europe, two from Germany, one from Copenhagen, and one from uh, South Korea. And so all international schools, so a little different, but um, they have had to grapple with this stuff before us, right? Because their openings are happening now. So this is really, really helpful to us. We're getting all sorts of really cool information. And so we're getting that ball rolling. So I, did, I wanted to be sure that the school committee knows that we're on it and that our families know that we're on it and we're working on it and we're gonna continue to work on it. It isn't gonna be easy. I suspect we're gonna be really busy this summer. I suspect we're gonna at some point be leaning on the school committee for a, a meeting in the summer when we typically would not have one <clears throat> because there'll be things that we have to discuss. So, um, but that's the way it is and, and we're all in and I'm thankful for the team that I have in that regard because we've got some good people who are, are really uh, working their tails off. As for the end of the year, I also wanted to mention that we know um, that people may have belongings in the school that will probably have to be packaged up and made available for students. We know that that's gonna to have to be arranged for, and we also know that people have our things that we're gonna want back before the end of the year. We're working on that. We're working on that um, right away. We know we still have some time, but we wanna make sure that we do that safely and consistently. And um, so you will be hearing more about that uh, soon. Now, uh, to speak to, um, uh, to Nancy's question, um, I didn't, maybe you could ask it for us now, Nancy, if, you're, if your uh, mic is working, and then, because I was going to have Beth weigh in on kind of the remote learning and how that's working thus far. Can, can you hear me now? Perfectly. Okay, great. So I think it's a couple part question, but one is, um, I guess, is there, is there a different policy in teacher engagement between elementary and middle school? Uh, secondly, um, what, what the prompted the call was a parent 
a parent and a group of parents and someone elected to call me and said, um, we're noticing differences between grades of teacher and great engagement at the elementary school level. And we're noticing it in with, you know, within one grade level, you know, so what is, you know, is there a guideline, you know, what is the guidance um, that teachers are given for engagement? And I, when I say engagement, I guess what I'm talking about is the interaction through like a, like a media like this, like a Zoom meeting, not homework, you know what I mean? Just like the, the level of engagement. Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer that, Beth? Or because I'm happy to as well. But. Yeah, I'm happy to. And, and Dr. Brown raised her hand as well. Um, so how about I start and then Dr. Brown, you pick up where I left off. Okay, so um, thank you for the questions. So the elementary, at the elementary school, the expectation is that every classroom teacher Zooms with their students four times per week. Um, and that can look differently. Um, it could be an early, you know, a, a morning meeting from responsive classroom where they get together and they do an activity and then talk about the work for the day. Um, it could be an, an interactive activity later in the day. It could be a mini lesson. It could be a small group where they're processing, um, you know, parts of the story. It could be extra help um, for math homework. Um, and then on Friday, as you know, we have the sacred all school meeting. So that counts as the fifth kind of touch point for students during the week. At the middle and high school level, the expectation is that um, um, for every class that a child has, which ranges between six and eight, that they have one Zoom session per class per week uh, and then access to office hours. So the difference there is they have numerous teachers um, for single subjects. Whereas our elementary teachers have to plan for um, all four subjects, including literacy, math, science, and social studies. Um, and so it looks a little different because the models and you know, the expectations of teachers at, each, at, both, at all three levels are, are different. Um, in terms of how the Zooms are used, I, I mentioned that a little bit, that it ranges from teacher to teacher. Really, the expectation from the beginning and the guidance from the commissioner, as well as um, you know, local psychologists and uh, child experts and countries, you know, as Andrew mentioned, that are ahead of us in this um, model is really to focus on the student engagement and the connectedness piece and giving students an opportunity to interact with their peers and, and the teacher. Um, just recently, there was the COVID-19 hierarchy of need needs that was floated around um, based off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you'll notice that you know 90% of the triangle is all about um, food, shelter, safety, um, connectedness, love, and then only at the top is learning. Um, so really, you know, the number one thing during a crisis like this that everybody is recommending is that connectedness piece. So that's where we started um, with our philosophy around Zooms. Recommendations from everyone is to make them just about engaging um, and less about content. However, um, since we've started to move forward into phases two and three and moving forward with the curriculum, we have given teachers some leeway as to um, they can bring content and curriculum into their Zoom meetings. However, it shouldn't be new information because we can't assume that students can log on to a Zoom session Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Every child, every family has different circumstances um, and we want to make sure that all students have access to the learning. So while students might learn about a concept from reading, in it, reading about it in a textbook or watching a brain pop video, um, they can process it as a class afterwards. Um, but again, the, the lean is really towards the social emotional um, component first. The other piece that I want to just mention because this came up quite a bit during our Zoom, co Zoom conferences last week with parents. Um, expectation is four Zooms per week. Um, you know, obviously the length of those Zooms is gonna range depending on the grade level. You know, you can't have a, a kindergartner sitting and Zooming for 45 minutes. So teachers have really been doing a lot of um, within their grade level teams, talking about what's appropriate, how best to use that time. And the other piece that came up last week is how for every one parent, and I think somebody already mentioned this, for every one parent that says this is too overwhelming, I can't manage all these schedules. I can't homeschool my child and take care of my family and do my job. There's a parent that says, we want our children Zooming with teachers six hours a day all day long. Well, that's not healthy for a number of reasons, but I also wanna make sure that we're not equating time on a screen with a teacher to learning. 
Learning as we know from the Academic Innovation Committee, learning as we know it from the portrait of a graduate is not sitting in rows and absorbing information from a teacher and regurgitating it on a testing quiz. That's not learning in the 21st century. So what we've been focusing on in the brick and mortar buildings has been student-centered learning um, and making sure that kids have voice and choice in what they do, that they can pursue topics within the curriculum of interest to them and really dive in deep and then be able to show their learning um, in new and different ways as opposed to just paper and pencil tests. So that being said, the remote learning model has basically forced us out of the traditional teaching and learning box. It's blown up the box, the box is gone, um, and forced us into new thinking. Um, and so you're gonna see a mix of some, you know, teacher-directed teacher conversations um, on Zoom, uh, but you're also going to see a lot of um, independent, student-driven voice and choice work at home that, again, speaks to the curriculum that we're trying to meet, um, but also is, is, is adhering to our philosophies around 21st century learning. So that's my two cents. Dr. Keogh and Dr. Brown, feel free to add in, and I'm happy to answer anything that wasn't answered. Well, the one thing I will add to that, Beth, that I think is really important, um, and this will be hopefully helpful to you, Nancy, in terms of um, in getting information back to families, and that is that Beth did a really exceptional job of, of um, capturing the questions that continually came up and adding those to our frequently asked questions list. I don't know if you've had a chance to put that online yet, Beth, but I know that's the plan. Yeah, it's partially up. Okay. Yeah. The, so, the list keeps growing. <laughs> well, well <laughs> And the list will keep growing, and, yeah. and un unfortunately, because we'll have a meeting next week and we may hear new developments, because after all, we just started the remote learning phase three last week. But, um, but hopefully that's helpful. Barb, were you going to add something to that? I'm just so thankful, Beth, that you went first, because you gave such a big picture uh, response. Um, uh, yeah, are the guidelines and expectations are... Um, uh, you know, super clear. Uh, obviously, teachers have within their different styles, different ways of getting there. Um, our, it, particularly with our younger grade levels, uh, we're not, I, I'm making a, 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 a very generalized statement here, but I've heard from many teachers that some of our younger learners are, um, I don't know if it's shyness or intimidation, but it's hard, we're not getting the participation from the big screen Zooms with, with 2022 participants. Uh, so the teachers are maybe having quick whole class check-ins and opting more for smaller groups. And I, I think that's definitely the trend in K1 and 2, um, where, in, where in the older grades, you, you're likely to see everyone start together. Maybe they break out into uh, different chat rooms based on the book discussion or, or you know, some, some interest-based topic. Um, but, but so the teachers are approaching it differently. Marlene, I'm not going to put you on the spot. I'm just waving to you. But I know if I look at Marlene's schedule, she's got a couple whole group, many small group, and then she allocates Fridays um, and, and some pieces of other days for quick individual check-ins with kids. So, um, particularly our younger teachers are finding that that balance um, elicits more participation and voice from our students in the video conferencing. This, our, this, this actually street speaks to a, a bigger problem uh, that we're going to have to confront. And that is that if we have to continue with remote learning, how does a teacher form relationships with kids right out of the gates using this model. And that is, that's concerning to me. And that, that actually is not an original idea. It came from a friend of mine who's a uh, English te a social studies teacher in, in Wayland. And he said, I just don't know how I, how I will form those relationships with kids I've never met right out of the gates using Zoom. Because Zoom, as Beth mentioned, I, I'm sure you know this, Amanda, as a teacher, it's very two-dimensional, right? You, it's very hard. If, if you watch a, a teacher like, I don't know, 
fill in the blank, a very energ energized teacher. <clears throat> they are all over the place. They're, and these kids are moving over next to this kid because this kid's itchy and they wanna make sure they're on top of that. They're keeping the questions going, keeping the whole thing moving. You can't do that with Zoom because if Beth wanted to talk right now, there's no way. And I know that we are taught to go one at a time, but in a real vibrant classroom, it's hardly like that. It's active. And so we, we're, that's why I say we're, we're working twice as hard and producing probably half as much as we could. And I think that's really important that we articulate that to our families because I, I, as I said to the parents last week, and I'll say it again next week, let's be honest, this is far from ideal. We're not happy either. We didn't want to go to remote learning. We weren't looking forward to remote learning. We had no plans to do it. We just decided on March 13th that we were closing the schools and then a week later we were running. So, um, but what we are learning, I hope, as we evolve through this process is that there are actually some silver linings and some benefits from this model. And as Beth said, one of them is having the kids some of their learning. So when we lament the fact that I never see kids out in the neighborhood like we did when we were growing up, that play was actually learning. It's really important to, to child development. And so we're starting to see some of that different kind of learning that's also equally important. So I think it's, it's a conversation that's not gonna end. We're gonna be having this discussion. As long as we have remote learning, we're gonna be having this discussion. <clears throat> but I would contend that the folks who are doing six hours of instruction on Zoom are not accomplishing any more than we are. I doubt it because I doubt that I, there's only so much a human being can take before it's just like, pfft. so it's a really challenging thing. And I'm glad you brought it up, Nancy, because it's something we have to continually discuss. And I think that the surveys that we did and, and the surveys that will come in the future are really critical to telling us how we're doing with that. And that means surveying of teachers and faculty and students, how are we doing with this? Sorry, Beth. No, and I just, one more thing to add too is we all are well aware of this, but we had no preparation, no time to jump into this. So our teachers have all created their own wheels and they're sharing their wheels with their grade level teammates to the best extent possible and, and tweaking them. Um, but they've been triaging and just working nonstop since this all started. Um, Dr. Brown and uh, Mr. Carnes have started to build in opportunities for teachers in addition to everything else they're doing to come together and start sharing ideas across grades about what's learning. This is the first time that they've kind of almost gotten to stop or at least slow down a little bit and, and figure out you know, what this train is that just hit them and, and how to move forward. But I know moving towards the summer, there's gonna be a lot of conversation about what practices work online, which ones don't. Um, I'm already investigating a blended learning class that I'm hopeful that most of our educators will take. Um, and in looking at blended learning, you know, there's a lot of research out there, uh, especially at the college level, because this is not new to them, um, which says that, you know, it's much like the flipped classroom model where students should be gaining the information and the content um, on their own independently through videos and reading. And then the time together should really be about processing that so that teachers can check in as Ms. Custodio is doing with small groups and uh, really see how kids are doing as opposed to looking at a screen of 22. So there's, you know, as Dr. Keo said in the beginning, this is a work in progress. We're by no means perfect, um, but we have a lot of discussion and uh, sharing to do between now and August. Does anybody on the school committee have any questions for Dr. Keo or uh, Beth? Okay, um, with that being said, in the report, in your packet is a warrant report, which is just the um, bills that I signed on, off on, um, and that's contained in there. Anytime you want to see them, you can. Of course, town hall is closed now, but um, you can make arrangements, and if you so desire, they will make them available to you. Um, next, we're gonna move to our fiscal year 21 budget update that Dawn's gonna present. Yes, thank you, Angie. And I have to thank Angie because she's been meeting us in the parking lots to um, sign the warrant. So it's become a chore in itself to figure out how we get our signatures. So thank you for your flexibility. We'll be reaching out to you on Thursday morning for another parking lot meeting. Um, we clean our pens often, Angie. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I, 
take this opportunity to update you a little bit on uh, fiscal year 21 budget. Capital is something that has been transpiring since our last meeting. Angie and I were both reached out to by the Sherburn Capital Committee um, about six, I think it was uh, four to six weeks ago, that at that point in time, they were looking at um, doing a, a smaller version of their annual meeting um, in June and then a larger one in the fall. And so they were asking all the town departments what capital projects would, would be necessary to approve in June and what could be put off into the fall. So we'd already started um, having that thought process when um, in the following weeks, they actually completely moved all of town meeting until late summer, early fall. What that means for the school is, as you know, most of the capital projects, um, the timeline that we complete them is in the summer. So uh, we had already, um, had, had already pulled two of the projects saying that we definitely want that one of them on the June meeting. And um, in addition to that, we proposed to the town uh, different ways that we could fund it if they wanted to pull those off of capital. Um, and that's actually with the postponement of the annual meeting until the fall, we're moving forward with funding two of your projects with um, available funds so that we can complete in the summer. The first project is the um, heat isolation valve replacement. If you remember, we uh, were able to look at that project a little differently. It's gonna come in at like under 10,000. We did put it on capital for 10,000, but with the closing um, of the school, we do have some maintenance cost savings that we're utilizing to take care of that project. And we actually have the um, contractors slated to begin actually on Monday um, for um, to go into the, that wing and replace those valves that we've been concerned with that are um, original to the building. Um, the second project that we knew we wanted to do this summer was the, the counter and sink areas in the um, C wing. Um, we had a we did a, a prototype of that in the teachers lounge this past year, so we sort of knew what we needed to take care of, and we had a quote that would be um, less than twenty thousand to do the four classrooms. So we, and in, in order to be able to do that this summer. Um, we're proposing that we use your building rental fund to cover that cost. So um, I think if you look back at your uh, revolving fund statement that we presented in March, you have about um, $65,000 in that fund, and we still haven't um, uh, recorded the $15,000 of rental income from Sheeta. So $20,000 would not be a huge impact to that fund, but it's a huge impact to the school in order to get that work done this summer. And in fact, we've already started placing the orders um, for those cabinets and sinks, and we expect that to be um, started also in late May and completed uh, within like two weeks in June. What that does is it sets up our custodians to get a lot of that capital work out of the way so then they can go in and do their summer cleaning and prepping without the interruptions of um, other contractors in. So I think it worked out well that we had already had this thought process because then um, when the town did postpone their annual meeting, we had a plan B that we could quickly enact on. Um, and so that is an update on the capital. So your third, um, on the ones that we're doing now, your third project was the HVAC replacement in the computer room. We are, um, we'd already said that's fine to wait to do that. Uh, next year, so that'll be in the fall um, town meeting. So that'll be your only capital project um, that will go before the town when that meeting happens. Any questions on the capital? Okay. So for that HVAC, does that get pushed to the following summer or does it get done over maybe one of the breaks? Yeah, we're thinking we could probably do it over one of the breaks. Um, uh, so that's what we'll do is once it gets approved, we'll maybe be able, depending on the weather, winter break or um, one of the other breaks. I don't think it's, uh, it's not intrusive to the interior of the building. Um, and so I think that's why we have more flexibility when we'd be able to do that. We haven't had any, I don't want to knock on wood, but we haven't had any operational issues with that unit. We just know it's past its useful life. Um, so we were fine with pushing it off if, if it sort of helped the town's uh, process. Thank you. So on the operating budget, when we um, did your final budget uh, approval in um, March, you know, we were discussing the, the enrollment situation in fourth grade. 
Um, and we had a plan in that if we felt like we needed to add a section based on how the numbers were coming in, um, we would fund that teacher through your non-resident tuition fund. So with uh, placement beginning, um, administration has decided to add that section to fourth grade. So you will actually be up a section for next year, it'll be 20 sections. So you'll have two group, two grade levels that will have four sections, first grade and fourth grade. That will give you most of your class sizes in the 18 to 23 range. Um, and I think even more so, we'd already decided that this was the route we were gonna go, but I think even more so with the pandemic issue that we're in right now, um, class sizes are gonna probably come into play. And so it, it, it's prudent that I think that we add that section. Um, you have funds in your non-resident tuition fund to cover the cost of the teacher. So that is not being funded by your operating budget. And then we can assess where we need to go the following year um, and, and decide if we need to include it in your operating budget for the following year. With that in mind, the, um, the building administration has been working on sort of the schedule for next year and adding that extra section and also taking into account, um, if you remember that we're adding music into your day schedule versus having that music instruction happen after school where parents um, participate by paying for the lessons. Uh, when they put all that um, in place, they're able to bring the music in um, with a 0.7 uh, versus the 0.8 that we had in the budget. So we have a little bit of savings from the 0.1 in music. That actually is gonna help us because adding the section in fourth grade sort of threw the equation off for our FLESS instruction. So we do need to increase our FLESS staffing by 0.2 to be able to accommodate um, all the sections that we have and give the regulated um, number of minutes that we have set up in our FLESS programming, but the, we will be able to take care of all of that within our current budget. So we won't be over budget. We have money that we can sort of swing around with the savings from music. And I think we'll make sure we hire appropriately so that we can fund the increase in the point two. And you already have a st uh, staff member in place um, who can step into that additional uh, point two for FLESS. But all in all, I think the schedule, and I, I commend um, Dr. Brown and her staff for spending the time on the schedule because it is a huge puzzle um, to put together. But I think what you're able to do is provide a well-rounded um, education in all uh, levels of academics to the students at Pine Hill. Thank you, Don. Does anyone have any questions? No, I, I appreciate um, how much work was put in to, for that fourth section, because I do know that the FLESS is a, a, an issue, you know, with that, and I know that does add an extra dimension. So just the fact how you were able to seamlessly work that out is greatly appreciated, and it'll be good for the students for next year. So thank you all. We appreciate that. Um, the monthly financial report, Don, is there anything you wanted to address? Um, just to give you an update, your financial statements as of April 30th now do reflect the transportation savings that you um, you approve the amendment at your joint meeting. So that now is reflected in your financials. Um, if you remember, we were working with about a $20,000 surplus the last time we met. Um, we've tried to encumber almost everything that we know from now until June 30th. Uh, take into account the transportation savings. Your um, operating surplus right now is looking to be in the $40,000 range. So we're hoping to have some funds to be able to return to the town of Sherburn uh, when it's all said and done, um, pending any emergencies that we that could arise that we don't know about. Um, and we're also still waiting to see what the impact is sort of on our utilities. I'm waiting for that bill to see what the building looks like when there actually really was no one in there for a month. Um, we had daily uh, custodial, um, checks, but other than that, it, it was not occupied even at the level that we are in the summer. So uh, we're hoping to have a little bit of savings there, um, but uh, um, it probably won't be a significant number. So we're looking at at least being able to turn back something to the town of Sherburn um, come June 30th. Thank you, Don. Does anybody have any questions about the monthly financials? 
With that being said, we'll move to the next item, which is the proposed changes to the 2020 2021 student handbooks. Um, and that's Dr. Brown, correct? It's the first read. Hi, I shared with you uh, a list of the things in the handbook. Uh, that are updated from year to year uh, because they're specific to faculty names or schedules or building maps, those kinds of things. Um, our, our school advisory committee, obviously we haven't met since, since the beginning of March. So we were always conceptually considering things that we should update and change in our handbook. Uh, but, um, uh, truth be told, we hadn't really sunk our teeth into that conversation yet. Um, as I look at the handbook, there's there's nothing, um, uh, you know, other than other than revising information about building routines that uh, will equate with the start time change, uh, and perhaps a lot of information uh, that may be an addendum to the handbook around uh, COVID-related routines that 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 are to be determined. Uh, there's, no, there's no big procedural changes to the handbook. Okay, so it was just in some of the wording? Because uh, I, I, I left you a roster right. of the pages. Uh, it, anything that, uh, again, is specific to the schedule, specific to naming people such as the school committee or the school advisory committee, uh, all of that will be updated when we're done with hiring and 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 all of that but there's no um there's no big procedural changes uh i'm not aware uh, our, you know our attorneys are always advising uh or as you're as a school committee as you're updating um uh, bullying policy etc that automatically gets updated in our handbook but there's no there's nothing by way of a a new conceptual idea that we were planning to bring to the handbook okay and we did the something Yes, go ahead. Angie? Yes. Um, what Barb said is really important, obviously. Yeah, there will be changes to our procedures um, next year, no matter what. If we had a regular opening, it really won't be regular uh, because we would still probably be practicing social distancing. There may be markings on the ground. There's, uh, there may be you know, rules around water fountains, uh, hand washing. Uh, there's a great um, website uh, that I visited today. I think it's, I believe it's the International School of Copenhagen. They had an excellent website that listed out all the kinds of rule changes that they're going through as they go into this new online model. We have a lot to chew on, but um, we would never be able to put that in this handbook. So those kinds of things though, Angie, would be, um, uh, the kinds of information that we would keep the parents well informed of in advance of any kind of opening. Okay. And I'm happy uh, perhaps at the September school committee meeting uh, to provide uh, specific information to the school committee packet for your um, knowledge. I, I just, I, I can't envision yet where our leadership team is spending a lot of time thinking of possibilities. Uh, and of course, what's relevant to the handbook will be incorporated. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown. The other, the next item is the school improvement plan. That's also a first read. Um, uh, the school improvement plan in your packet, uh, um, again, through input from our curriculum leaders or, uh, our parent advisory group, all of the um, work that our leadership team does, our faculty uh, teacher leader teams. Uh, we, uh, I, I, as I went through our current school improvement plan, I was pleased at how much we were able to attain in the first three quarters of the school year, uh, this current year. Um, but you'll notice, you'll notice that the big tenants that we're working on um, we rolled into next year and, of course, incorporated uh, under the guise of student wellness and innovative teaching, which are sort of the, the overarching tenants in our school improvement plan. Uh, it, uh, 
making even more effort to uh, concretize the steps with innovative teaching tools and pedagogical uh, shifts that we're making um, in part due to remote learning and in part due to all of the portrait of a graduate work and you know 21st century learning uh, work that we're doing. Um, so you'll notice that the big tenants are the same. We're working to grow our teachers uh, in their instructional, their workshop model. Uh, for reading and writing. We are uh, working to incorporate new social studies standards, which was probably the area we made the least amount of progress in this year. We, there was definitely progress. There was K through 12 coordination, uh, but we didn't get to the part where we really nailed down the power standards uh, K through 12, or, or I, I can speak for K through five, uh, um, that will drive the decisions we make into next year. So that will, those will continue to be big focus areas. Uh, it goes without saying that student wellness through responsive classroom, through all of the tenets of challenge success, and through best practices and research um, are all the more important as we um, reconvene in typical and atypical ways in the fall with our, our re reunite our teachers and learners uh having all experienced a very anxiety provoking unsettling time in history and a uh, very fragmented society and uh so we we look forward to really putting our money where our mouth is to make sure that we are leading with uh well-being and and student connection uh in the the utmost uh positive regard and respect for learning, learning communities. Um, I noted some of our benchmarks uh, were delighted. <clears throat> we were planning to offer responsive classroom training again this June, as we did last June. Uh, last June, we had 15, we maxed out our, our uh, the available enrollment with 15 educators from Pine Hill and another 15 from Chickering. This June, we have to offer it virtually. I personally thought that teachers might be a little overloaded with uh, remote learning and teaching, and that's not the case. We have our nearly, uh, we're nearly um, sold out, if you will, uh, with spots available, uh, including new educators that we anticipate bringing on board. So um, continuing the structures that we have in place for making sure that uh, we really, like I said, we, we, we walk our talk uh, with regard to attention for social emotional well-being. I have to say that I remember at the beginning of the year touring the classrooms that had been redone with all the, you know, bells and whistles to make learning more adaptive for everybody to where we are now. It is a changing landscape and I would imagine that what Beth was speaking of the blended learning that she wants for people to pay, perhaps take a, you know, advantage of this summer, that would also be included in this. But um, I commend all the teachers for being able to adapt because we started off with changing up classrooms and now we've had to change the entire way we learn just remotely. So there's a lot to learn. Anybody else for anything for Dr. Brown? So that takes us to our approval of the minutes for March 10th. And I had to think really far back when I read through those because it seemed like actually a lifetime ago because it, the whole world just flopped on its head for me. But I did not see any errors. I didn't know if anyone else did. I read through them. Like I said, it was just, it was, it was not that long ago, but yet it seems so long ago. So if you have any um, corrections or anything that we need to add or change, if you'll let me know now. And if there's not, if I could have a motion and just remember, take your, go off mute and make a motion and you'll state your name and I'll call on you and we can second it. So do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Mike Fitzgerald, motion. Very good, Mike. And do I have a second? Nancy Cordell. Nancy seconding. And um, any discussions? All in favor? I'm gonna poll everybody. Remember Amanda? Amanda Brown. Yes. And Megan? Megan Page, yes. Mike Fitzgerald? Mike Fitzgerald, yes. Nancy Cordell? Nancy Cordell, yes. And Angie Johnson, yes. 
And the rest of the information in your packet is just uh, for your pleasure reading, the Dover School Committee minutes and the Dover Sherburn Regional School Committee minutes um, from the 5th, the 3rd, and the 28th. Yes, Beth? I'm sorry, no, when you're done with that, okay. last an announcement. So that's it. And so let's go to Beth's announcement because then after that, we're done for the evening. This was perhaps one of the quickest meetings and everybody except Don will have a quick commute home. Don actually is in the office, so. <laughs> go so ahead. For, those, for those of you who aren't done with Zoom yet today and would like to join the Challenge Success uh, webinar at 6.30, I believe you all received emails. It's also on our remote learning website. So it's an opportunity for parents and teachers um, to uh, learn from Challenge Success, their suggestions on how to support our student learning at home. So I will see some of you there. Okay. And also thank you for accommodating that by adjusting the time of this meeting. Yes, Great yeah. I, and I, I kind of like having it a little earlier. It kind of worked out for all of us. I was just making sure that Mike could join us because he, you know, has, has his, his day job there that doesn't end sometimes until very late in the evening. So thank you, Mike. Yes, thanks, Mike. Look, no problem. Everyone's busy, believe me. Yeah. Thank you all for all the work you've put in. And um, we will see, we have another um, regular meeting in June and that will wrap us up for this year um, until we have a summer meeting perhaps to figure out what to do next year. So with that being said, we will adjourn the meeting and it is 6.03. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.